Well, let me invite you to get your Bibles out. And aren't you glad he has won the victory? Amen? Amen. You know, songs like that, they give you goosebumps because we know who we are. We know what we have. We know where we're going. And folks, we're going to be there for all of eternity. Amen? Amen. I like what I heard a godly saint say sometime back. There's not going to be another negative for the rest of eternity. Those aches you've got right now, they're going to be gone someday. And they're going to be over and done with. Well, as you know, we've been in a series on the seven sayings from the cross. And if you would take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 23 or follow along the overhead... Have you ever wondered what people say in their last few moments of life before they're getting ready to die? I just happened to look up some of the last things that people requested before they were getting ready to be put to death or before they were getting ready to die, maybe by injection or whatever it was going to be. And I just want you to listen to some of the requests. A man by the name of Victor Fuego requested a single olive with a pit for his last meal as he hoped that it would grow into an olive tree inside his body. A man by the name of John Gacy, he wanted a bucket of KFC because he had served as a manager in three KFC restaurants. Another man by the name of James Edward Smith asked for a lump of dirt as his last wish. William Bonin, he wanted to die of diabetes, get this, before, his execu- before uh, execution, and so he wanted 18 servings of Coke and Pepsi, and three helpings of chocolate ice cream. A man by the name of Jonathan Nobles, he wanted to have the Lord's Supper as his last meal because he had become a Christian and a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing what people ask for and mention in their last request before they're getting ready to die. You know, Jesus is suspended between two thieves and he is getting ready to give the last measure in his body For the sin of the entire world. You have one thief on one side. One on the other. What side were they on? The Bible really doesn't say. We want to think that maybe the believing thief. Was on the right hand side. Because we were living a right world domination. I don't know which side the believing thief was on. But last week we looked at the first saying. The the pardon from the cross. But today we're going to look at the second saying from the cross. Has to deal with paradise. When Jesus uttered the words to the thief. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Follow along in the scripture. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Dost thou fear God seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, listen carefully. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The second pronouncement from the cross is Jesus' words to a thief who is dying of a capital offense. Don't know what the offense was. The Bible doesn't give it. There's no, uh, there's no interchange about what the thief had done. The Bible doesn't even give his name. But Jesus makes a declaration in that last statement as to what is going to take place in the thief's life when he dies. But before we do that, let's back up and let's look at all, first of all, let's look at the plea to Jesus. Now, it's interesting when you back up and you listen to the thief that is on the cross, there's so much that takes place in his conversation and what takes place in the interchange between him and the Lord and Savior. You know, you think about it for a moment. Jesus had asked the Father to forgive those who were persecuting him because they didn't know what they were doing. Didn't they know they were hurting him and crucifying him? Yes, they knew that. But they didn't understand that he was the Lord of glory. They didn't understand that he was God in flesh. As a matter of fact, he looked a lot like uh, uh, he was clothed with humanity. Looked like a lot of other humans in that day and time. But he was God clothed in the flesh. And that's what the word incarnate means. It means clothed in flesh. 
He wasn't a human being. He was God clothed with, a human, with human flesh upon him. And then you find this thief. He's getting ready to die. The Bible doesn't say how much longer he would have been alive. It just, just says he was being executed. But I want you to notice something that is, takes place in the plea of the thief toward Jesus. I want you to notice something about the sight that is in the plea. Now you need to get the picture. You need to understand something that's taking place. Jesus Christ is dying on the cross and it looks like you know, he's just a, a normal individual dying. There is no power demonstrated. He's dying on the cross. His friends have abandoned him. Public opinion has turned against him. And his enemies are out to assault him and assail him. The one thief on the other side says, If you are the Christ, if you really are who you say you are, why don't you demonstrate it by a mighty act of power and get us off the cross? Well, you know what he was wanting. He was wanting simply to be released, to go back to his life of crime and do what he did before. When you look at this thief that's on the cross, there's something evident in his life. There was a sight in his plea. Now, what do you mean by sight? He saw something that this other thief didn't see and others around him didn't see. He knew who Jesus was. He knew that Jesus was God in the flesh. The Holy Spirit was at work in his life. Now, you need to understand, he is dying a most hideous, cruel death. He is dying. Lightning bolts are going through his body. He is trying to catch his breath like all the other, the other thief is. And, and they're going to be dead in a short time. But in the, in the dying of that thief, there is a sign in the plea. He saw something by faith and not by sight. What did he see? He knew who Jesus was. How do you know that? Because he said, Lord. He said, Lord. Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? In other words, the Holy Spirit was at work in his heart bringing about a new birth experience. Do you realize that nobody gets saved just whenever they want to? A lot of people say, well, you just walk down the aisle. That's all there is to it. And shake the preacher's hand. No, that's not all there is to it. Unless the Holy Spirit draws you, woos you, convicts you, there is no salvation. You can't just say A, B, C and get saved. There's got to be the wooing and the work to get the Holy Spirit in the human heart. The thief was the only one on the cross who recognized Jesus for who Jesus was. Do you know who he saw Jesus as? He knew he was the pardoner. He knew he was the paradise giver. How do you know that? Because of what he said. Now, Jesus might have known a little bit about it. Well, he would have known his background being God. What he did and what had taken place. Jesus knew everything that this man had ever done. Don't know if he had killed. Don't know what he had done. If he had maimed. The Bible just doesn't say. But the Bible makes it very clear. That there was a sight in this man that the world did not have. Do you realize that you can be beside Jesus and not have sight to see Jesus? Look at the other thief. He's dying on the cross. He was right beside Jesus. He was next to Jesus. He knew the voice intonations of Jesus. He knew how Jesus' voice was, if it was a a strong voice or what type of moderate voice it was. He knew how Jesus sounded, what type of human voice Jesus had. But the dying thief did not have any sight in in his plea, the unbelieving one. And that's a reminder that if we're going to come to Jesus, you don't come by sight, you come by faith. No matter what the world said about Jesus, no matter the fact that he was hanging on the cross and he looked like he didn't have any power about him, this man knew he is the Christ, the Son of God. The Bible makes it very clear that there was a sincerity as well in the play. I want you to notice something. The other thief on the cross was saying, if thou be Christ, if you be Christ, save yourself. But I want you to notice what this thief says. Remember me. When you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Do you know what this thief knew? He knew he was dying. In a short time he was going to be dead. He knew in a short time he was going to leave this world. And go out into eternity. Do you realize the Bible says. Everybody in the world knows there's eternity. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3 verse 11. God has put eternity in the hearts of mankind. 
They don't need a preacher to convince them they're going to go out into eternity. Everybody knows in their being because they've been created and made by holy God. They're going to go into eternity someday, someplace, somewhere, and sometime. He knew death and hell was real because he turned to Jesus. Now let me ask you a question. Why would he turn to Jesus if there was no such thing as death, no such thing as hell, no such thing as something to dread? He knew there was. Every one of us in our being, we know there's death and hell. We know there's a place of torment, of doom, and of damnation. You don't hear it a lot anymore. But I can tell you on the authority of the Word of God, there is a place of damnation and torment, and it's going to last forever and ever and ever for every unbeliever. Regardless of what they do or do not do with Jesus. And the reality about it is, this thief didn't say, if you come into your kingdom. This thief said, when you come into your kingdom. When you arrive at your home, Lord, when you get to your home, would you remember me? He believed Jesus was who he said he was. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you believe Jesus is who He says He is? Do you believe He's the only way to the Father? Or do you believe you just pick out your way and you go with your way? And that's, you know, whatever way works for individuals, that's the way they, they choose. We live in a world that's said that there are about eight or nine worldviews. What that means is people look at life from one different lens or another. People would say about us, well, now you're looking at life through the lens of Christianity. People look at life through the lens of of uh, uh, Islam. Others look at life through Hinduism. They say, you know, you're really just going, going different ways to get to the same place. Well, there's only one problem with that. Jesus announced himself, nobody gets to the Father, God the Father, but by me, Jesus Christ. He didn't say you can use Hindu, uh, Islam, or whatever. He didn't say there's two or three ways. Jesus said, I am the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the truth about it is there's a lot of individuals who may even go to church and say, well, we need to be tolerant of others who have worldviews. I do love them. I care for them. And I care that they come to know the truth. Because Jesus said, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. This thief knew there wasn't another way. This thief was sincere in his plea. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, the life of faith believes in spite of what's happening in the moment. Now listen carefully. He did see Jesus dying on the cross. How do you kill God? How can you kill God? Folks, we don't understand a whole lot of things. Amen? If Jesus is God in the flesh and he's dying on the cross, then he, I don't understand. Listen, I'm so glad I don't have to understand it to believe it. I'm glad I don't have to understand the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit to believe in them. I believe in the Trinity. You won't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but it's all throughout there. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Listen, someone wisely said, you try to explain the Trinity, you'll lose your mind. You try to explain them away, you'll lose your soul. But there was a sincerity in his plea. There was a sincerity. Listen, it wasn't just lip service. He believed in his heart Jesus was who he said he was. But there was also a third component. There was a stout-heartedness to his plea. I want you to notice something. You need to get the picture. The thief is dying and people are railing at Jesus. The other thief is saying, if you're really the Son of God, if you're really Christ, come down and save yourself and us. And the thief that is dying and believing in Jesus, all public opinion is turned against Jesus. But can I tell you something about the faith that believes? It's a stout-hearted faith. It's a believing faith. There was a stout-heartedness inside him. It didn't care what others said about him. He was going to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what faith does. Faith believes in spite of. And genuine stout-hearted faith is convinced and it exercises faith. It doesn't matter what the public says. We're going to find a whole host who are members of churches are not ever have not been born again because they don't have much faith to stand when the storms come. 
If you have a faith that takes you to church very little, you will probably not have a faith that will take you to heaven. And listen, this man, the Bible makes it very clear that he said, he's done nothing amiss. He told the other thief, why don't you just mind your own business in essence? He's not done anything. Do you realize that thief did a whole lot more than what a lot of born again believers do? He stood up for Jesus. He stood up, he spoke up, and he declared who Jesus was. He is the Son of God. You say, does it say that in the text? Well, it does. He's done nothing amiss. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Friend, there's only one person who has a kingdom. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he says, I want you to notice the suffering too. You know, not only does he give a tremendous plea, but I want you to notice there's some suffering. Someone wisely said that pain exposes who we are. Well, if that's the case, I want you to listen to, the, to this thief. Now, probably, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have given him the time of day based on what he did. He's dying. He's being executed for a capital offense. But in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his suffering, he exposes something about him. Listen. Listen. Can I say this about you and me? When pain comes in our life, God exposes us. Watch what happens when you have some pain. That's why a lot of people, as things get worse and worse in our world, you watch, there'll be a great vanishing in the church. Pain will cause them to go, well, you know, I, I just, I just, that's why, because so many are lost. Ruth Graham said, I wouldn't be surprised but what 70% of church members are lost. And I agree. Why will not being a child of God bring a person back to worship again and again and again and be faithful? It could be they don't have very much at the very outset. And the Bible makes it very clear he was suffering. It didn't matter what suffering he was going on. He said, Lord, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. His pain... Didn't stop him from confessing. It didn't stop him from believing. It didn't stop him from announcing who Jesus was because he saw who the Jesus was. He was sinful. He was sovereign. He was the Savior. And he knew that. Listen, there's something else that's in his play. The Savior. I want you to notice something. He was aware of who Jesus was. This, listen to his announcement of Jesus. This man has done nothing amiss. Translated, Jesus has done nothing wrong. I, here is a thief, and if he would ever lie on somebody, why not lie right now? Nothing says he had much of an integrity about him or he wouldn't be on a cross. But his spirit, the Holy Spirit was working in his spirit. And he said, I know in my soul Jesus has done nothing wrong. You know, he knew Jesus to be sinless. He knew he was the Savior. He knew he was sovereign. Now let me ask you a question. Looking at the thief and looking at your life, how do you compare? A lot of us don't have the faith of the thief. A lot of us don't have the boldness of the thief. That is the believing thief. You know, he didn't start well in life. And you know, there's a lot of people that start well. I mean, they start out like a house on fire. And I mean, they're going great guns. And all of a sudden, they just fizzle out. And you wonder, where do they go to? I've seen people like that in, in the ministry. I remember when I was in college at uh, Cumberland. Man, there was a bunch of us ministerial students and you know, we would go out and we'd preach in the community. We'd do revivals and we'd do all sorts of different things. And, and uh, others were going to change the world. And I would talk and we'd how what we're going to do when we get in our first church. Here's what I'm going to do when I get in my first church. And I look back, I thought, Lord, thank you for helping us. And now I look at some of them, I thought, where are they? What are they doing? You see, you can start well and miss out in the end. This man, he didn't start well. He didn't even have a good middle. But I can tell you this. 
The single greatest thing in his life he did, he did at the end of his life. He allowed himself to believe that Jesus is the only way. And he saw the Savior in the plea. Now, I want you to notice a second. I want you to look at the promise from Jesus. Verse 43, look at it carefully. Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now listen, those are not just words. They're just not simple words. They're words from the sovereign of the universe. Listen, one word from God will change your life. Because He is the authority. He is the God of all ages. He's the God of the past, the present, and the future. And I want you to notice something. When you listen to what Jesus said, I want you to listen to the affirmation. You know, there's an affirmation. There's, there's an affirmative in, the, in this promise that He gives to the thief. If you'll notice, there's a word, the very first word. Because whenever you take this verse apart and break the words down, in it, they're awesome. First of all, I want you to notice the word verily. The word verily in the New Testament is mentioned 151 times. Now, it's mentioned as verily 106, and it's mentioned as amen 45 times. Now, what is taking place? Jesus is saying, amen, I affirm, I declare, it is a contractual statement. I am giving you the affirmation as I promised. I am God in the flesh. I am declaring to you that today you will be with me in paradise. Man, you can die with that. Amen? You can die knowing that, wow, Jesus says yes about me. Jesus says yes about my faith. Listen, this man had failed. This man had bobbled. He had dropped the ball. And, and he hadn't done anything. But he found the grace of God. He found the goodness of God. You know, Jesus is announcing to this thief, I give you a contract, thief. I, the sovereign of the universe. Now listen carefully. Do you know what the word testament means? Do you understand what the word testament means? It carries with it the idea of covenant. It means covenant. It means a contract. There is an old covenant. There is a new covenant. And the covenant is always entered into. Now there's two types of covenants in the Bible. There are those conditional covenants. Whereas, you know, I'll do something, says the Lord, if you do something. And there's those unconditional covenants. How many of you have done, you know, once you got saved, you have been good enough each and every day in your life to stay saved? Not a one. The Bible says there's none that does good. No, not one. But I want you to notice something. You know, the Bible makes it very clear. Jesus said, I give you a contract. In other words, God says, verily, or amen, or I affirm to you. I affirm to you your sins have been forgiven, and today you're going to be with me in paradise. Now listen carefully. Can you say that about your sins? Can you say that your sins have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ? Can you say that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know today you're a child of God and you're going to heaven? It may shock you, but I've not always done what I should do. No, that don't shock you. We're all flesh, we're all human, we're all made of this fallen nature. Now what may really shock you, my wife hasn't always done what she should do. Now that really shocked you. But you know what? We're human. We're flesh. And Jesus gives to this thief. You know what that says? Listen carefully. You don't have to live a sinless life to go to heaven. You can have a lot of junk in your life and come to Jesus and he'll forgive you. You can have so much stuff in your life that you can even be at the point of execution. Like the thief was. Or Carla Faye Tucker back in the, I think it was mid-90s where she killed her boyfriend with an axe. And she finally came to faith in Jesus Christ. She was executed, but she was executed a born-again believer coming to faith in God through Jesus Christ. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ knows no barriers. It doesn't matter what we've done because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses of all sin. Amen? That's exactly what this thief realized. But I want you to notice the foundation of the promise. Listen to what it says. You know... This thief deserved nothing. 
he didn't deserve a single thing, then how is he granted, how is he granted paradise? I want you just to look at this verse over here. There is none that doth good, no, not one. Say it with me. There is none that doth good, no, not one. In other words, you've never done anything good enough to be saved. You're not doing anything good enough to stay saved. And the Bible makes it very clear. I want to save you, thief. I want to save you. It doesn't matter what you've done. You respond to the Holy Spirit. You respond to the Holy Spirit conviction of sin, of judgment, of righteousness. And I'll save you. But there's also a limitation to this promise. I want you to notice something so intriguing. Today shalt thou. Do you realize there's another thief on the cross? But Jesus says, Today shalt thou, or shall you. Jesus did not say, Today you both shall be with me in paradise. Now get the picture. Use your spiritual imagination. Jesus is on the cross. The believing thief on one side, the unbelieving thief on the other side, whichever way they were. And Jesus spoke to the believing thief today. But you know what, he, what basically he's saying to the unbelieving thief? Today you will be in hell. Today you will be in torment. Why? Because he ignored Jesus. He rejected Jesus. He turned away from Jesus. And the reality of the world we live in, you hear me say it from time to time, there will be 150,000 people that today will leave planet earth. They will die from all nations, cities, locations in the world. Majority of them will die and go to hell. Why? Because they rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. They rejected the revelation of God in His world. They rejected the moral compass that's on the inside of them. You say, well, well maybe they don't have a chance to, to hear the gospel. God made it very clear that the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen? Somebody made this world, folks. And it was an evolution. I want you to listen to me say this, and I don't want you to miss it. Evolution is the biggest farce and the biggest lie that has ever been perpetuated on planet Earth. You say, now wait just a minute. I don't know about that. Well, listen carefully. You've got to do one of two things with Genesis 1. Either God created it or God lied about it. If God didn't create it, then He lied about creating it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, why does God allow it to be perpetuated? Why does God allow it to... Listen. God gives us a thinking mind. I don't know about you, but listen. I'm going to err on the side of believing God, okay? He's never done me wrong, never hurt me, never harmed me in any way. Given me eternal life, given me a wonderful wife, a lovely family. I can't say that about human beings. Now, which would you rather err on, the side of believing a God who cannot lie or human beings? And supposedly, I was just coming up the road this morning. I was thinking about evolution. And uh, have you ever seen a guardrail evolve? Have you ever just gone down the road and just seen a guardrail pop up on the side of the road? Have you ever just uh, gone to a car lot and watched a car just evolve on that car lot? Isn't it amazing? Have you ever just, uh, you know, watched a bologna sandwich evolve into a steak? Have you ever watched a dollar bill evolve into a hundred? You say, no, but I'd love to. Now listen carefully. Listen, use your good, common, God-given sense. If evolution is so powerful, why is it not still working? Why is it we never even use the word? Where did you, who made that? Where did you get that? Where did that come from? How long did it take? We never even say the word evolve. How long did it take your watch to evolve, Pastor? No, nobody asked me that. They said, where did you buy it? Did you get it this? And here's the point. It's a lie. And you know why evolution is a lie? It directly contradicts the very word of God. So now wait just a minute. You know, I can, I can be a Christian and believe in evolution. No, you can't. You either decide God is truthful or evolution is truthful. And the reality of it is, this thief... By the way, did you know evolution didn't come into existence until uh, the mid-1800s? 
And somebody said, was there dinosaurs in the ark? Well, you don't know because the word dinosaur didn't appear on the, on the vocabulary market of the world till the year 1845 or somewhere thereabouts. And, and the reality of it is we live in a world where Satan is deceiving man. But here's the reality of the thing. He knew the promise. And the promise was to him. Why to him? Because he believed. Listen, it matters what you believe about Jesus. It matters what you declare about Jesus. I want you to notice not only the limitation to the promise, but I want you to notice that there's a, a accompaniment with the promise. I want you to notice, Jesus said with me. I love that, don't you? Whenever you die, you're going to be with the Lord. I think about my precious dad. And I think, now I know my dad don't have a lot longer on this earth. He called me just the other day and asked me to pray for him. He said, uh, I've had a light stroke in my right hand and it's partly, I can't hardly move it much. So I'm going to check on him tomorrow. But he knows where he's going. And folks, I'm glad I can say I know where I'm going. I hope you can. And Jesus announced to the thief, I want to tell you, you're going to accompany me today in paradise. Now get the picture. Use your godly imagination. Hanging on a cross, pain, agony, all of the hideous feeling. And then he's going to die. And the awesomeness and the grandeur of paradise. The awesomeness of where he's going to be. Now it's interesting that Jesus used the word paradise. Because he gives him the location. I want you to notice. He said, you're going to be with me in paradise. Now, why so? that's so important? In this passage, along with only two other passages in the Bible, is the word paradise mentioned. And it has the idea of like the Garden of Eden, the lush, wonderful. It don't mean like a 20 by 20 uh, garden or 30 by 30. Garden that beyond our mind's imagination, a plush of wonder, of beauty and majesty. And Jesus said to the thief, he said, I announced to you today that I'm going to take you with me and you're going to be with me in paradise. Now God help us that it doesn't happen to any of us. But some of us could die today, right? Some of us could die of a heart attack. We could be killed in an automobile accident. We don't know. But you know the wonder of this thief is this. Today you'll be with me in paradise. In other words... He didn't have anything to give Jesus. He couldn't promise Jesus to be, that he could be baptized. He couldn't promise Jesus one day's worth of service to him. He couldn't promise Jesus anything. I want you to listen to this very carefully. When you cannot promise Jesus anything, he will still save your soul. Amen? Because salvation is not based on us promising God a single thing. It's based on the goodness and the mercy and the wonder of God. You know, the Bible makes it very clear. This man, in just a few hours, he would die. The Bible is silent about how he was buried. The Bible is silent about where he was buried. The Bible is silent about who came and got his body. There's no reference to that. But this man, you and I will get to meet person to person someday. I'd love to see him come up to me. Maybe, I don't know what his name is. Please don't think I know his name, but I'm going to use uh, a biblical name. His name may be Bartholomew or something. He walks up to me and says, Benny, good to see you in heaven. Now, well, and who are you? Now, I don't know all the interchange. Don't you remember reading about me? Don't you remember preaching about me? I am the thief who persecuted and killed. But I am the one who turned to Jesus in my dying hours. Friend, you can say what you want to about Jesus, but here's the ultimate thing you better say. I believe in him. I confess my sins to him. And I turn to him as my Lord, as my Savior. There's going to be a lot of church members that aren't going to heaven. You say, are you sure of that, Pastor? I'm sure of that. Because I watch people who exhibit no faith. It's not biblical Christianity. There's a lot of folks who 
It's very, very little they give to the Lord. That's not what biblical Christianity. Think about it. Paul gave the last measure. Biblical Christianity, you give. There's a lot of folks that are in churches all over the world. Baptist, Methodist, whatever name you want to put on them. They're sitting. They're sitting in their finery today. But they've never been redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Why don't you come today and give your heart and life to 